Hello everybody, LZ Hold here, and this is my update for the week of November the 18th. Joining me via satellite from the moon is Rebecca <laughs> Ivey. <laughs> I'm touring the moon right now. How is it up there? <laughs> it's great, it's great. You know, it, I, I, I just saw Superman and all what's her nuts being able to breathe in space, it's great. Oh, yes. Reference to last week's show. Yes. And yes. referencing this week's show, which we're going to be talking about Alien 3, I guess I can ask you, can can uh, screams be heard in space? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, we were doing these shows. It's been a minute since we did Aliens, but we're yeah. going to go ahead and jump into the third part of this infamous trilogy, probably the most decisive part. If you leave out some of the later things, which I don't even know, is that considered a part? Like Prometheus is kind of its own thing, right? That's, I don't what, even... I, that's what I think. It's its own thing. Because we're kind of talking about this. This this series is the Sigourney Weaver series. Well, then you have part four. And we're still <laughs> thinking about whether we're going to do part four. I, I Sometimes I wonder, can we do an hour? On part four, but I think it's safe to say we can do an hour on part three. And we're going to give yes. it a shot. Yes, um, all, all of the hoopla that went on. Well, I want to get, I want to get some of your opinion here about this pre-production debacle. Um, Studio meddling. <laughs> and that that could be the subtitle of Alien Three. Alien yes. Three Studio Meddling. Yes. Because. Very early on, I think after the success of Aliens in 86, 20th Century Fox decided that, you know, we want to go ahead and do a third one right away. Because, uh, you know, money. Yes, obviously, <laughs> and, yes. But good old Jimmy Cameron, he was a little busy prepping a movie called The Abyss. So that was not a possibility to get him back on it. Um, so they turned to the Brandywine guys, David Geiler, Walter Hill, Gordon Carroll, who had obviously produced the previous two, mm -hmm. and he said, well, you know, could we get a third one? And the Brandywine guys were all in agreement that if we do a third one, it should be different. Yeah. They didn't want to rehash the first two. So they came up with a pretty interesting concept, which maybe was a bit ahead of its time. They thought about doing it as a two-part film. So mm -hmm. you would have... Alien 3 and Alien 4, and they would bleed into one another. Okay. Uh, their idea was that maybe in Alien 3, uh, Michael Bean, Corporal Hicks, could be the star. I'd heard that. Yeah. And yeah. Sporny would be basically in stasis the whole time. And then in part four, it would be the two of them together versus the aliens. I think I would have liked that. It is an interesting concept, and it went. They went a long way with it. They actually uh, hired writers based to write things based on this concept, and the first script uh, by a guy named William Gibson was based on this concept. Uh, September of eighty-seven. Uh, Gibson, who was a famous uh, sci-fi writer, uh, mm -hmm. it still is. And he was very much influenced, he said, by the original Alien film in his prose writing. So when they offered him the chance to write the script, he was like, well, of course. <laughs> you know? And so he wrote this thing, which <clears throat> sort of what he he described it as a Marxist space empire, uh, tr uh, you know, sort of uh, a duo of films. Mm -hmm. And the idea basically was that the Sulaco, which is the ship they were on at the end of part two, that it would be discovered in a place called the Union of Progressive Peoples, which was a part of space that was uh, ruled by a kind of Marxist group. Um, and so they pick up the Sulaco and they find everyone in it. Uh, a group of military guys go into the ship and they discover that Bishop has a, an alien egg put in inside of him had been had been sort of uh, secreted inside of him by the queen so one of these aliens pops out and gets on the face of one of these fellas these uh, you know military guys uh -huh. and so they take this Salako ship to a place called anchor point 
which isn't a military installation, but it's almost like a, a commercial center in space. It's like a mall in space. Okay. And they put this guy who has the alien on his face, they kind of put him away because these people, these uh, union of progressive peoples, they have the same idea that the company did about weaponizing the aliens. Mm -hmm. And so then, of course, it gets free and all hell breaks loose on the anchor point. And Hicks, who has come out of stasis, has to lead the charge to try and, uh, you know, kill them. And Sigourney would basically be a cameo at the end because she would remain in stasis for the whole movie. Where's little Newt in this one? Um, Newt, I, that's a good question because I haven't read this Gibson script. Okay. All I can go on are, are uh, now I, I know you can find it, and there's actually okay. been a comic book adaptation fairly recently. I think I've heard about, yeah. Because this script is very infamous. Like people go, wow, if they had made that, that would have been an awesome movie. You okay. know, it's one of those things. So Gibson's script became this infamous lost script. Why doesn't, why doesn't the studio ever learn? You, you think, you know, well, let's look at history here. Every time we meddle, yeah. The movie doesn't do well. We leave them alone. Usually it does well. That's true. You know, there might be a scenario where, yeah, whoever's in charge is a cuckoo bird and the movie flops. But but it seems like every time you hear about, oh, the studio meddled because they thought they knew it, they knew best. They knew best. Yeah. But it always yeah. turns into a disaster. And, of course, they're like, oh, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. And then fans hate it. And well, I mean, and that's the interesting thing is, you know, Sigourney was all about, even though she was just going to be a cameo, she liked the idea. She was on board. They had talked at one point to Ridley Scott about yeah. coming back and directing, but he couldn't because of scheduling issues. Yeah. Um, so that wasn't really an option because the Brandywine guys really wanted Ridley back. Um, so they did get a young director attached named Rennie Harlan, mm -hmm. who had made Prison and he had just made Nightmare on Elm Street Part 4, The Dream Master, which was a huge hit. Mm -hmm. And so this was like the, the big deal uh, to get him on board. He was the hot, you know, young hot director. Direct. Yeah. Finnish director he was. And he worked with Gibson on the script. <clears throat> um, his big thing, his contribution was he thought it would be interesting. I'm talking about Rennie Harlan now. Mm -hmm. He thought it would be interesting if somehow you could go to the alien's home world. Like, that was his big thing. And they started to incorporate some of that into the script. Because the idea was, well, what if at the end of the movie, we lead into like a cliffhanger where we have to go to the alien's home world and destroy them at the source? Yeah. So that was part of uh, Harlan's thing, there was also some some talk from the producers about having it end up on Earth, uh, bringing the aliens to Earth, which there is a, a really infamous uh, early trailer that was released to theaters. Showed Earth. Yes, and it and said on, fans, on Earth, everyone. Yeah, and fans, used. everyone thought it was going to be, and then when it came out, people were like, what happened to Earth? You advertised that in the trailer. <laughs> right. Yeah. And you watch it. There's no Earth anywhere in Alien 3. Um, so, but I think even John Landau, who was the studio exec, even he admitted later that the whole problem with Alien 3 is that they were trying to make a release date and not yes. make a great movie. It seemed like release date and budget. Yes. Yeah. That was, I think, the problem with this whole thing. They're like, we're getting this out on X date, and so no matter what you can cobble together, it's coming out then, you know. And then they started rolling with these trailers, these little teasers that have are based on an earlier concept, and you're already throwing it out there. And so already we're off kind of to a bad start, you know. Yeah. It's kind of like a canon film thing. It is, Yeah. And that kind of brings us when, back. When to I read I, about it, that's what I thought. I was like, oh, "This sounds like canon cutting budget. Yeah, be out by a certain time. Nothing is cohesive throughout the whole process. Things keep changing on a daily basis." And well, you know, the the producers really ran Gibson off because Gibson, yeah. he said that you know they was just dragging feet. Nobody knew what they wanted to do. And so mm -hmm. that was why William Gibson ultimately moved Peaced on. Out. Yeah. yeah. 
So they still tried to kind of develop this thing using, uh, uh, you know, there was another really good writer named Eric Red who had written uh, Near Dark, a really good vampire movie. Mm-hmm. He wrote uh, The Hitcher with uh, uh-huh. with uh, Rudger Hauer. Go now, ahead. Is he the one that, that came up with the monk world with the wooden planet? No, that's coming no? late. Okay, no, sorry. No, okay. it wasn't Eric Red yet. Uh, Eric Red was basically, he was hired to do a really fast draft on the Gibson, like a, a redrafting. And the problem was Eric Red said himself, he's like, I hated what I wrote because I didn't have any time to write it. Yeah. So he had to just kind of work out this thing. And then they started to think about new ideas that you could maybe incorporate into this Gibson. And I think the money came into play and they started thinking, well, does it have to be two films? You know, it's that sort of thing. It's like you commit to one thing and then you're like, well, does it have to be that? You know, Um, because at one point, with Eric Red, they were talking about um, doing like a small town inside of a biodome, like having some sort of satellite where you have an American town that people live as if they're in America, but they're actually in space under a dome. Okay. Um, that's a weird one. I don't, I don't know. All of a sudden, we're starting to get way far away from Anchor Point and the Progressive Peoples and Gibson's thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, and we're also pretty much moving away from let's do this as a two-parter deal. Um, yeah. So I think Eric Red was pretty happy when his short tenure was over. Uh, and yeah. he, like a lot of people involved with Alien 3, does not look back fondly on this whole thing. Debacle. Yeah. So then they brought in another screenwriter. It's like a cavalcade of screenwriters. <laughs> and a lot of them are really good. Like they brought in David Toohey, who's a really good screenwriter. He's written a lot of good stuff. Um, he wrote another draft. He tried to bring it back to more of Gibson's idea. But he did. He is the one who introduced the idea of a prison planet. Uh, that maybe instead of Anchor Point, that the Salako would be taken to a planet that was full of convicts. Uh, but the same sort of idea, Sigourney being in stasis the whole time and Hicks being the star. And actually, they they were even starting to move away from Hicks being the star and starting to think about uh, like a whole group of people that just find the Salako. And because I think there was a little bit of a question at this point if Sigourney wanted to do it. Yeah. You know, uh, and I mean, it, she did with the one script, it sounded like. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, She's yeah, the probably Gibson. just starting to get tired of all the shenanigans. Yeah, and maybe she got an idea that you know this could be a, a train wreck. <laughs> yeah, but you know they and at this point with the Tui script with the prison planet. Uh-huh. Uh huh. What happened with Rennie Harlan was he said you know one of the reasons he wanted to go to the home world of the aliens and stuff like that was he wanted to see something different. Yeah. He wanted to get away from people running down corridors and bulkhead doors and the kind of things you saw a lot in the first two. Yeah. And when Tui developed this prison planet idea and the producers really lit to it, Harlan was like, well, when I think of that, all I can think are people running down corridors and more, you know, bulkhead doors. And it it would look kind of the same as the other one. Yeah. So Rennie Harlan pieced out. And he went off and did the adventures of Ford Fairlane, which that's a whole other show with Andrew Dice Clay <laughs> and Robert Englund. Um, but to his script, it, it, it didn't really, the more and more it was starting to move away from having Ripley in it at all. Fox didn't like that. Even though she was on the fence, Fox really thought Ripley should be in it. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah I read somewhere they wanted like a, a male lead and mm-hmm. no one you'd met before. Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. Fox, well, the, ultimately what Fox says, we got to get Sigourney Weaver in this. Yeah. And so they offered her, you know, $5 million plus a percentage of the gross. And did she get a bonus for shaving her head? Well, that, that was kind of thing. The, was the, initial, the initial $5 million was just like a, a bulk thing. But they, the deal was if they had to do reshoots, and her uh-huh. hair had grown and she had to reshave it, then she would get a bonus. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That was part of this gotcha. deal as well. Gotcha. Now, Sigourney, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, she wanted to die at the end of this by this that point. Was, that was that like was one of big, her things. 
Yeah. Um, and she also she's wanted. Like, I'm tired of this. <laughs> she also wanted a, a, a lot less guns because I think we talked about it yeah. on our last Alien show. Part. She wasn't. Yeah. She was a big gun control person at yeah. that. I don't know if she is now, but she she was definitely then. And you know the the old story was <clears throat> that she was an alien too, and she got on set and there were all these guns and. She had skipped, I guess, the stage. I still don't see how you can read the script for Aliens and and go, uh, there there are guns in this. So yeah, I mean, it's all guns, you know. It's so militaristic. But she didn't mm-hmm. like that. It's an and action wanted, film. Yeah, yeah. And so she wanted to pull away from that altogether. She also wanted there to be fewer aliens, and because she thought it was there were too many aliens in Aliens, and the the. The other thing which I think may have affected part of the story that me and you have talked about objecting to, she wanted to keep Ripley a loner. Because she said she thought Ripley was a more interesting character when she was basically having to go it alone. Um, I don't know that that was a very good demand. I don't think so. I thought part two, she was the most interesting Yes, because you had her filling in as sort of a surrogate mother role for Newt. You had this, you know, I don't know if it was really a love thing with Hicks, but there certainly was a bonding there. Yeah. And you, you had those scenes where you saw, you know, Hicks and Newt and Sigourney or uh, Ripley together and it had sort of a little family kind of motif. I was going to say, yeah, it was like an unconventional family by the end. Right, yeah. This situation and these creatures had formed this, you know, had taken away, you know, Newt's family. And in a way, the company had taken away Sigourney's family, her daughter, by keeping her out there so long and all that stuff that happened. Yeah. You know, and so they... And you could even say Hicks's family. Yeah. Uh, you know, his brothers and sisters in arms, totally destroyed, decimated. Yeah. So uh, these events, all these horrible events that this evil corporation has done to these people, you know, force them into a new, you know, unconventional family, which they all strongly cared for each other by yeah. the end. And there was and a it, sense at the and end. There was of, a sense of hope at the yes. end of the second one. It's exactly and you went, what okay, I was Okay, even even though all this these horrible things happened, you know, they have each other at the end. You know. And even, the last and, shot, you know, where she's almost looking over her daughters as she yeah. sleeps, you know. Yeah. Uh, the reflection in the tube, which I always thought was a very kind of strangely moving little shot. Yeah. Uh, all things considered. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, the triumph and the hope at the end of Aliens was pretty quickly uh, a shadow Jeez. on. <laughs> <laughs> but I know. It just was just, it just, Yeah. So I don't know, I don't know if Sigourney's um, influence in that way helped ultimately. Yeah. Um, but anyway, we'll go on with because now we're getting to Vincent Ward, and Vincent Ward is the fellow you were mentioning earlier. Okay. He had uh, directed a really visually arresting, a very interesting movie called The Navigator: A Medieval Odyssey. And Walter Hill, uh, one of the producers, had seen this movie and basically offered him the job to direct Alien 3. Uh, Vincent Ward read the scripts, the Tui scripts on the prison planet, and um, didn't like them. He, he was not a fan of the scripts as they existed so far. So as he boarded a plane to fly to Los Angeles to have a meeting with the execs, mm-hmm. Ward began thinking of a concept that might be better or more interesting, which he came up with a pretty interesting idea, I think. Uh, The idea was that Ripley and her pod and her escape pod wound Mm -hmm. up crashing onto a wooden satellite that acted as a monastery for monastic, uh, for monks, you know? And the studio heard this. And they were like, oh, that's really interesting. Yes, approved. (laughs) They really liked it. They liked it so much that they decided to throw out Tui's script with the prison plan, all the previous drafts. Prison what? Yes, huh? Yeah, threw all that out. Um, They brought in a a screenwriter named John Fascano to work on fleshing out Ward's concept along with Vincent Ward. Okay. 
And the basic, um, the idea of this new script, the Ward script, uh -huh. was, as I said, Ripley's pod crashes onto this planet. At the beginning, there's a, and it's not really a planet. It's, this is what's real interesting, the wooden world thing. It's like a satellite that was made and put into space. But it's com made completely of wood, and there are many different levels in it. And some of these levels could be there, hundreds of miles high. And wasn't like the center technology that sustained them or something was all the... Yes, because they were, they were really big into... This is where the, the religious aspect comes in, because as yeah. I said, they were monks. So everything, all the technology there was almost like medieval technology. Yeah. It was like a, um, a throwback society living inside of this thing. And it, so the movie starts with this monk looking up and he sees you know, a star in the east, and that is her pod crashing. And they take it at first as a good omen. But the thing is, no women have been on this monastery in like 10 years. This is yeah. a totally male uh, group of monks. Um, now, the problem is, obviously, her pod has an alien on it, planted there by the queen at the end of Aliens. Um, I, I do want to say, this is back in the good old days when... You had a story problem. You wrote your way out of it instead of saying, yeah. "Okay, we're starting over." You know, yes, it was still taking from the ending of Aliens. You know, and, and trying to explain, "Okay, well, how did she get on this wooden world?" And everything. So they thought these monks thought that it was the devil that this yeah. this alien was a literal incar <clears throat> literal incarnation of the devil sent to punish them for indiscretions and for sexual temptation. Because, again, Ripley is the first woman on this planet in 10 years. Yeah. So blaming her, they lock her away in a dungeon. And she's trying to tell them what's really going on. She's saying, you know, guys, it's not a demon. It's not the devil. It's an alien. And we can stop it if you help me. And this is how we could do it. And, but they're all kind of lost in this religious mode. And eventually she gets free. A lot of the monks are killed. And she helps them to destroy the alien, but she sacrifices herself in doing so. Wasn't there a draft where, yeah, she is pregnated? Yes. And the monks do this ancient thing to remove the... Mm, yes. Yeah, that's in this script. Okay. The as in the script. Okay, I wasn't sure. Okay. Now, if you look at that, you can see, like, in terms of story points and structure, a lot of that survived, yeah. you know? Because th from this script... They started building the sets. Yeah. So they were building the wooden planet, the monastery. It's a um, lot of money. Yes. Over they were pinewood. <laughs> they were so into that that they started to actually, this is what we're doing. Um, so just forget about that trailer with the on Earth everyone can hear. Yeah, we 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 we're we're over this now. We're done. Right. We, now we're going wooden planet. Going to the wooden planet. Um but more and more. What if a fire broke out? <laughs> well, you know, there were some, and that would be real interesting because, you know, the aliens thing is fire. Yeah. So I would be interested, to, you know, what the, the alien is afraid of. So that would be an interesting way of uh, throwing in an obstacle on this wooden planet, I think. Mm -hmm. it, may, it may have. Unfortunately, a comic book has not been made of this script. Um, though, what a missed opportunity. Yeah. More and more, Fox had been getting cold feet on Vincent Ward because they were seeing some of the concept designs, and some of the concept designs are really weird. Like they was wasn't this the script where was it Geiger had like all these different types of aliens, forms of aliens, or was that later? Uh, yeah, he was brought in, and he was brought in to do some ideas. I think Vincent Ward did a lot of the sketches for this one. Okay. Um, because he did that, these weird sketches where it looked like an alien was blended with a sheep and, you know, because they had animals there. They raised animals on that was their source of food and stuff uh, and milk and things. But so Fox was starting to see some of his stuff and they were going, yeah, this is getting really artsy. Yeah. Like, you know, they were thinking, well, Ridley's was commercial and Jim Cameron's was really commercial. And are we so keen on having this guy? But was Ridley's really that commercial? If they had first seen it, they would have been like, this is artsy. I think this you're right. Weird. I think you're right. Yeah, I think that that is something that's come along in hindsight. 
because Ridley's was very different than anything you'd seen up until then. <laughs> you know, it was just so dark, so quiet, and so intense. You know, as Ripley used to say, it was uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre in space, you know, because that was his yeah. big influence, was Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He loved that movie. Um, well, this, I don't know what you would compare the Vincent Ward. Uh, I guess you would say Salvador Dali meets aliens. You I, know. I think it would have been interesting to see it. I would so love to have seen what Vincent would have done. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. we didn't really get to do that because, like I said, the Fox people were like, eh, this is artsy fartsy. Uh, yeah. They started giving him little suggestions like, could it be a, a refinery instead of being a monastery? Yeah. And then they started throwing out stuff like, well, instead of monks, couldn't it be, I don't know, like prisoners? So they just yeah. Up on these prisoners. Um, and Ward was like, no, that's a totally different concept. You wrote, you, you signed off on this. I pitched this, you signed off on it. And now you're coming up with a new, you know, a totally new thing. You want to just dumb it down. And, and a lot of this, you know, Fincher later said that a lot of this was being dumbed down. Like that was a big thing. Let's just make it simpler was always the studios thing. So you had this, these massive sets for this monastery being built, as you said, at Pinewood. Huge sets. And they're ready, to, you're basically ready to be, they're ready to be filmed on. Well, then they fire the director, Vincent Ward, because he refuses to make this, this list of changes. Um, and so you had to go back to, you know, David Geiler and Walter Hill. Yeah. And they tried to take the list of changes the studio wanted and implement them. You know, instead of monks, they'll be prisoners. Instead of, uh, you know, a monastery, it could be a refinery, even though we've yeah. already built the monastery. But then they yeah. started going over and telling, you know, Norman over there designing those sets going, hey, uh, so that set you designed for the monastery, could we just like throw some dirt on it and make it look like a prison plant? <laughs> Because the, the sets that were built for this movie, that are in this movie, were meant to be the prison. I mean, were meant to be the monastery. Yeah. You know, which is why you have all those the glass with the w interesting little religious iconography in it. And, mm -hmm. you know, Norm, he did a great job as a production designer because um, he had worked on the previous two as well. Um, they brought in another writer named Larry Ferguson to try and refine the script even more. Apparently, the, the draft he turned in was something nobody wanted to do. <laughs> Sigourney Weaver walked off the film at that point after the Larry Ferguson draft and so you know here you go we need to start shooting and our star just left um, oh no they said well how do we get Sigourney back and Sigourney says well listen if Walter Hill and David Geiler wrote the script for the first one which you know they did even though Dan O'Bannon gets full credit they they wrote the final script he, she was like if you can get Hill and Geiler to write the final draft, then I'll come back. Because she was kind of, I think, sick of this whole, you know, uh, first one. She script. doesn't know. She doesn't. She keeps getting scripts every week in the mailbox. She hasn't finished reading the other one, and the other yeah. one's already arrived, basically. And, and it's something completely different. Totally new concept. And, and not to mention, she's probably got a start date on this at this point. So she's like, I'm supposed to be on the set when, and the script's not done, you know? And we're I've got to do my homework. Different. Yeah. Yeah. And every time she gets a script, it's different. Apparently, the Larry Ferguson one wasn't very good. It was not a step up. It was a step down. So they agreed. Guyler and Hill agreed to do the final draft of the script, um, even though they actually weren't the last screenwriter to work on it. Uh, so basically what Hill and Guyler did was they tried to take Vincent Ward's idea, structure, mm -hmm. which had already, uh, was already being prepped in England, mm -hmm and meld that with the Tui script where you had the prison planet mm -hmm. and at the same time keep the studio happy with this list of demands. We don't want this, we don't want that, that's too artsy, this is an mm -hmm. artsy, you know. So that's how you ended up with something of a script when they started shooting. And I say something of a script because it still wasn't finished. Yeah. I mean, they had, so they, you know, they had this, so they hired David Fincher. We'll go ahead and jump 
into that because we're about to that point. David Fincher was a very young but very well respected music video director. Yeah, he did all of Madonna's biggies, Vogue and Express yep. Yourself. He did Dear Father, which he actually talked her into doing and um, a, to release as a single because he mm. wanted to do a music video for it. But well, I don't think that one charted the way the others did, and it kind of killed her little streak there. But <laughs> he had an amazing eye. He yes. very dark, you know. Yes. Um, and he's always been very dark, but yeah. he had a and good eye. Did he work for ILM? Yes. He, yeah. Okay. Yeah, he started out as an effects guy. So I mean, he already is familiar with what this is going to need. And I think that's what I think there were there were like two sort of aspects to why he was hired. I think number one is because he, he had this great visual style. He had the effects background. But I think two, he was very young and the studio thought, well, we might not have as many problems with him. Maybe we can kind of get him to go here and there. Unfortunately, they never learn. <laughs> yeah. They didn't know David Fincher too well. <laughs> even as a young man, David Fincher was not really a pushover. Especially well, when it came to what he wanted to do. I mean, the fact that he was directing Madonna music videos, that should kind of clue the, the ones that he directed, the scale mm -hmm. they were on. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. would think that would clue them in. Like, yeah, yeah. This guy means business. And he was, he was serious about it. He really wanted to make a great movie. And he contributed a lot of ideas that wound up in the final film from, you know, early conception from yeah. this kind of unfinished script. He's the one that came up with the idea of shaving their heads. Um, that the planet might be infested with some sort of, um, you know, lice and ticks and things, so the prisoners have to have their heads shaved. The barcodes on the back of their necks, very David Finchery, that idea. Uh, mm -hmm. That was another thing he came up with. And he also came up with the idea of an, uh, having a new kind of alien not showing the same alien and he's the one that brought hr giger on okay because he wanted giger to design a new alien an alien that would move on all fours would be very fast and agile and not just the same thing you'd seen before yeah and and you know he was a fan of giger's work on i mean how could you not be giger worked on alien did not work on aliens the sequel but they, obviously they kept his designs, a lot of his designs. But so I think Fincher was like, well, let's get Giger back. That could help, you know? Yeah. So Giger did this whole new... But the studio once again. <laughs> once again, yeah. Because Giger really, when he redesigned it, he redesigned it. Yeah. It was going to be like, as Giger said, Puma. So that's like the Puma, you know? And he's it would be on all fours. And he wanted to give it like a feminine lips. Like lips? and a tongue right a tongue that would come out not just like a, a tube with a thing on yes. the end he, he, he was done it. with tubes by then he was done. no more tubes because he took the tubes off the back too yeah um because since it was going to run on all fours you, you have tubes sticking out of your back it might not be very effective yeah. but yeah he had this idea of the tongue would come out and go down he was like maybe it at one scene they it kisses a monk and it goes in the mouth the, and it rips out the inside with the tongue. You know, he does this whole thing. And uh, ironically, that was not used because that was too far out for Fox. <laughs> uh, but You're like we're getting artsy again. We're getting artsy. <laughs> but you know what? What's weird is if you watch that movie Species, where Giger designed the Sill monster, the the alien human thing, the sex creature that kills men. Yeah. This is what Seal was. He just used yeah. it later. For, for, he's like, by God, I'm going to get the tongue in something. And you fit <laughs> out and it goes through. And so that he eventually got his, just not in this. Yes. So the only design <laughs> of Giger's that wound up in Alien 3 was um, the, the, they call it the Bambi Burster. You know, when it comes out of How the ox. Or the dog, depending the dog. on the version you see. Um, the, the, and then they use that, you know. Um, but basically, the, the alien, it looks a little different. but it, And it does run on all fours. But the design that's in the final film is it basically... It looks, yeah. It's the same as before. I yeah. did like the Fincher concept, though. Because the concept is 
that the alien takes on the physical characteristics of what it's yeah. impregnated in. Yeah. It bursts out of. The so genetics, it, yeah. Yeah. So the one, the other ones stood tall and kind of walked like a man because they came out of humans. They were implanted mm -hmm. and burst out of humans. In this one, it comes out of a four-legged creature. So, you know, uh, as I said, it's a dog in the theatrical cut, and it's an ox in the and assembly they, cut. Yeah. Um, but either way, it's a four-legged creature, so it has a different sort of physiology. Now, I heard that, like, poor Fincher couldn't even direct his movie properly because they're rushing him they're trying to get shots in because of budget and, and the script kept changing so he couldn't really plan yeah yeah and he was even beyond he, this point of script changes because he had was already it, talking about he brought in another writer to help help him called rex pickett who worked on he was the day-to-day -day, like on set writer uh and because you know guyler and hill weren't weren't on set every day because uh, they were busy producing, and they were already big time producers, so they can't be there every day. So, um, so yeah, I mean, the script is constantly in flux, and yeah. Yeah, I think you had Fincher trying to do all these really interesting, wild new ideas uh, with visuals and with even with the concept of it, because he maintained a lot of the monastic stuff from the Vincent uh -huh. script. But now they're just really religious convicts. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't mean like we're rapists and yeah, and we're, we're 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 murderers, and that's why it's not safe for a woman to be here. But we're very religious. Yes, we're we're trying to be very religious. <laughs> just not trying very hard, uh, <laughs> except for for um for for Charles Charles Dutton. He was uh, I always think of him. What the Rock? You remember that TV show he used to be on Rock? I do not. Yeah, he was, but he's the, he's the main, like, monastic prisoner. He's the one that's telling brothers, we all have to stick together, yeah. you know. So anytime I see him in this, I think, hey, it's rock. Uh, <laughs> I think they canceled that show pretty quick, but it was on Fox, like, in the In Living Color days, like, okay. right at the same time. Um, okay. But anyway, it was actually a great cast. Him, Charles Dance, who I think is a great actor, uh, played the doctor. Um and that you had a great cinematographer, Jordan Cronenwealth, originally. Unfortunately, he wasn't around the whole time because he yeah, had... Parkinson's, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He started the film. And he could physically do some things, but he couldn't do everything. And it became too difficult with the symptoms that he had to, to climb around inside these weird environments and stuff. I mean, he was, just to give some perspective, he was the cinematographer of the original Blade Runner. Yeah. An incredible cinematographer. So they had to bring back, uh, they had to, you know, bring in a guy named Alex Thompson who did his best to match what what Cronenworth had done because he shot a lot of the movie before he, had, he just couldn't do it anymore. So they had to match that. And he does a good job. I mean, I don't really look at this movie and think the cinematography doesn't match. I mean, it's all pretty consistent in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and it does. It, it, I think it is beautiful in a dark way. I, I like the cinematography. And I like the look of the movie. Um, I like some of the crazy stuff they did when the creature is running through the hallways and you know, they flip the steady cam to make it look like it ran up the ceiling. And I mean, there's some real interesting, innovative stuff. Um, but I think fundamentally, and we can talk about this a bit here, is you have this, you don't have a story. Yeah. You know? And I think, I think if, if Cameron had come back, they would have avoided that because he would have been like, my script. Yes. And he would have made them wait until the script was right. Yes. You know? You're not I, announcing a date until we're done with this. Yeah. And that's how you, you, you're supposed to do it. I mean, in my humble opinion, I have a little bit of experience in the filmmaking <laughs> world. It never works out. It we're very just going to release a movie by this date. We don't even have a script. It's okay. Yeah. It's, it's just okay. It'll, it'll come together. I can't think. I'm sure somewhere, somehow that has worked. But I can't think of a single example right offhand. Um, well, particularly when you have too many cooks in the kitchen, which seemed to be the issue here. Everyone trying to say what direction it needs to be in with the executives. And then you got poor Fincher trying to lead the ship, but they're not really right. letting and Fincher, him fully do that. 
And he's trying to throw in these wild, interesting ideas, and visually he's doing a good job. But, I mean, at one point they even shut down photography so that he could cut it together and see what was missing. I mean, that's never a good sign because you go, what part of the story is missing? That You know, so let's well, stop. Well, if you it. had a script and a list, yeah, of, yeah you know. You would know what I, was missing. Wasn't there a scene where they didn't show how one of the characters died, so they just added in a scream, like an off-camera scream or something? Yeah, yeah, that did happen once. Um, there were a couple really weird things that went on with the this whole like editing cutting process, because mm -hmm. that, that's probably the most infamous part of this Alien Three, I would say. And that's when Fincher pieces out. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <sighs> He really had a trial by fire, Fincher. I mean, his first feature film, it, it, it was... I'm surprised he did it again. I mean, most people would have that experience of, I'm never doing this again. I but do he goes know, on and he's very successful. Incredible, you know. And, and he's one of those directors now where you, it's like a, a mark of quality when you hear that Fincher has directed it. Yeah. And another thing I noticed that was... And and I was watching something, and they pointed out, I was like, yeah, I remember thinking that. They don't really explain how the egg and all this stuff gets on the ship. Yes. Yeah, and that's not explained <laughs> on any of the, in any of the cuts. Yeah. It's just there. Um, it has a, there's a really cool shot, because sometimes my mind goes, and maybe I try to be a little more, you know, optimistic about certain elements of the movie than I should, but... Uh, I think of some great shots in it. One of the great shots I can think of that I really think is genuinely creepy and well executed is at the very beginning during the credit sequence, which the credit sequence is this sort of impressionistic thing where you see like glass cracking and you don't know what the hell is going on, but you know yeah. something's going on in those pods. Yeah. Um, and the, 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 the little section of the ship that that they're in that they're in and the Salako breaks away and you see this great shot where it, you know it's like straight on and it pushes back and then falls to the side and the camera goes out and then turns and you see it tumbling down toward the plant. I love that shot. Mm -hmm. I think that is a really great creepy uh, shot. Great music too in there by uh, Elliot Goldenthal, who I think did a great score for this. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I try to think of things like that. But overall, man. I, I love the story about Michael Bean getting pissed when he found out like his character wasn't going to be in it. They killed him off and then they were using his image. And he's like, no, you're not using my image. Oh, no, no, no. Do you think that that was made even worse or even more uh, made him even angrier when he knew that he was supposed to be the star? Probably. I would be pissed. You know, you know? Like, oh, OK. And then it's we killed you, dude. <laughs> Yeah, it went to, yeah, from no. being you're the star of the movie to the alien came out of you, which it doesn't in the movie. They changed that. But originally, the alien was going to come out of Hicks. Yeah. Um, and then eventually it just came down to, well, we're just going to use his picture and you're, he's going to be so fucked up you can't see his face, you know. Yeah. So and the picture, the picture looks like something off of a, you know, video game. Yeah. Kind of, yeah, that little, that little yeah, square. The line yeah. thing. Um, yeah, 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 he got one thing he did say. Remember, he said that he got paid more for that picture than he did on the whole, you know, for the whole thing of Aliens, the second one. <laughs> I didn't know He's that. Like, I'm getting money off of that picture, I'm gonna get paid as much as I did off the whole movie. And I was watching this one thing where I don't know if this is true, but he had supposedly said later, well, if he'd known David Fincher was gonna go on to do the movies he did, he'd probably been like, you can use it for free. Just you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. But, Who but, knew? I wonder, but I wonder, you know, if Fincher looking back is going, I don't blame him for screw those guys. They were turds. <laughs> well, I mean, the studio, I, you know. Yeah. Well, I could, I, I, I've read some interesting things about Fincher's reaction to this movie. Um, I think maybe before I say that, though, let me just say this. You were saying before about the bonus that Sigourney would get if she shaved her head. Mm -hmm. They actually had to to figure that one out because, like I said, they cut off shooting at a certain point, cut cut the movie together to see what they needed in the script that wasn't there so they could write it and shoot it. And during this time, Sigourney's hair started to grow. So when they finally figured out stuff that they needed, you know. She's it, like. Yep. 
it's bonus time. She's like poor miracle girl on her head. Yeah. <laughs> and they go, uh, well, Eating and this, her biotin. <laughs> you got the the um, the uh, the cheapness of the studio because they said, no, nah, we're not going to pay a bonus. Let's just put a ball cap on her. <laughs> <laughs> so they had made the effects people create a ball cap with all that these little so bitty sweet. hairs punched into it. Now, bit- was that cheaper than actually paying her a bonus? It couldn't. I mean, those kind of things are pretty expensive because, yes. you know, I don't know. You probably have to have multiples made. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because you would need one every time you took it off. Yes. It was destroyed. So you yeah. have to do another one every day. Uh, but that's that's what they did. You know, they did that. Um, uh, Terry Rollins was the editor of this who helped him cut the original version together and unfortunately had to cut the other, the studio version. Terry Rollins was the editor on the first Alien with Ridley Scott. Okay. And he was a very good editor, and he really fought for Fincher's vision. And he was really disappointed when what came out came out. Because he thought they had a pretty strong film and could have been made even stronger um, if they had put a little more time into it. But they were just so damn rushed that, you know, they they did a lot of like well like for instance there's an opening scene with oxen in this film you know mm-hmm. in the assembly cut which eventually was released mm-hmm. uh, which introduced the Clements character on the beach the Clements character being the doctor the Charles Dance character Washley uh, you see Ripley washed up on a shore all that stuff is actually really important yeah because not uh-huh. only does it set up where the oxen came from but it also sets up like how Ripley got on the on island this, yes. You yes, know, you know, we don't piece. need to know this. No. Yeah. <laughs> and you set up, like, who Charles Dance, his character, who Clements is. Because you, you know he's a doctor in the movie, but you don't really know anything about him. This kind of shows you that he's a loner and he's off uh, away from the others. It does a lot. But so with that whole, like, 15 minutes cut out of the front, the movie feels kind of weird. Yeah. The, the theatrical cut feels weird at the beginning. Yeah. Because you're just it suddenly does. there and yeah. it doesn't really make very much sense. I mean, <laughs> I don't know that. I know in the assembly cut, they put it back, in, the alien comes out of an ox yeah. instead of a dog. Um, I don't know why that change was made. Uh, I don't know why they would go, we don't was want it, it coming out of was an Was it because, because the dog, you know, people would feel more, you know, I'd be like, fight this, but because it's a dog and disgusted by it, yeah. And, well, and the could, dog carries, yeah, carries that could it. be. I must say, though, I mean, when, when I think of you know, we were talking about the alien taking on the traits of who it comes out of or what it comes out of. Really, if you think about it, a dog is more agile than an ox, mm-hmm. so I don't know that that's necessarily a horrible change. Um, that's I think the least of the, the problems. problems, yes. Um, I know one problem, and I don't know if this was why it was cut, was because, you know, the, the little baby burster, the, the one thing that Giger designed that wasn't, it was a rod puppet. And okay. they were developing, and also a lot of the alien stuff is rod puppeteering. And they were developing at a time a way how you can rod puppet something against blue and then somehow integrate it into, because this is early CGI. And, yeah, I was going to say, we're on the cusp. Where we're in that, right. that, that transition period. It's still a little shaky. It's yeah. like, I don't know if we can really do this, but we're going to try. And I know that when they did the rod puppet originally on the oxen birthing scene, they had to remove it because it didn't look good. It, they, they couldn't figure out how to make that work. Yeah. Now, the theatrical cut does have a lot of stuff with the alien that is that rod puppet against the blue screen thing mm-hmm. that worked. But I think at this point, they were almost to where they were like, well, if it doesn't work, let's at least just put it in a place where we could cut it, you know? Yeah. Because uh, we weren't entirely sure. Um, yeah. I think probably the weirdest thing about the theatrical cut is the Gallic character, the crazy guy. Because, he, you know, he doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense why he's there <laughs> in the theatrical version. No. In the assembly cut, you know, you have all this stuff showing him being crazy. And he's like, the, he's even cr- too crazy for the other inmates, you know. 
And so when he sees the alien, he thinks that the alien is some sort of a demon. So it kind of goes back to that monk demon thing, but just with this one character. And then, you know, there is the entire sequence where in the assembly cut where they capture the alien. You know, they they manage to get it into this room. They close the door. It's captured. A lot of them die in explosions and stuff trying to get it in there, but they capture it. And then you have Gallic, who's in the infirmary, sneaks out, goes to the door, and decides he's going to release this demon back onto the to the population. And so he's the one that sets it free. And then, of course, it kills him because the alien doesn't give a fuck who he is or what he's doing. Yeah. You know, it's just going to kill him. Um, all of that being removed Doesn't, makes yeah. the character in the theatrical version totally used because he's just in two scenes and then he disappears and you don't know what happened to him. So yeah. it's kind of weird. But the assembly cut in that way, I think, helps make it a little bit. And I like the whole bit where they tra trap the alien. Uh, yeah. I know I saw an interview with John Landau, the studio guy, who was trying to justify this tomfoolery. And he was saying, well, you know, if, if you trap the alien, then you remove the threat. And I'm like, no, you don't. He's still it's, alive. He he's can still, still get out. Yeah. And the whole tension is when is he going to get out? That's the idea. Because you know he's getting out. You know the movie's not over at like an hour. Yeah. And, I was going to say, yeah, we're... Yeah. we're <laughs> we're not that far in unless it's a um television series so it's one of those that's one of those things with john landau where you just kind of hear that interview and you want to go just shut your face dude look just you're leave just, creative just, for the creative yeah you're just trying to justify your bad decision right and you and, won't admit that you were wrong yes exactly um there was also more stuff with uh you know because lance hendrickson appears he appears as Bishop from, from two, but he also appears at the end. A different as, character. Yes. Who there is this big mysterious thing even to this day of was that a human? Is it another. another bishop? Because he gets hit in the head and he bleeds red, which you see in the assembly cut more than in the theatrical cut. Uh in the assembly cut, I think he says, I'm human. See, I'm bleeding. Yeah. Uh, that's not in the in the theatrical one at the very, very end. Um, also, something they threw in against Fincher's will was when she jumps into the molten lead, they had the alien pop out of her chest. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was, a, you know, something they threw in. In the assembly cut, that's not in there. She yeah, just, she just goes. Goes, yeah. And, you know, you know it died with her because it was in her. Uh, so... I don't know. You know, the assembly cut, I think, is good. But ultimately, it's kind of hard to judge it because it's still unfinished. Yeah. You know, they released an unfinished film. Yes. They released a cut unfinished film. And then years later, we got to see a more true to the vision version. Unfinished that's still film. unfinished. Yeah. Uh, I mean, even it doesn't matter if it's the assembly cut or the theatrical cut. That one optical of her falling backwards into the lead looks terrible. It does. Like it, it does. And didn't they get like an award nomination for the effects so. in that film? Yeah. I think they were, maybe they were just blown away by the blue screen rod puppet stuff. And maybe. They, or was it know. a slow year? I don't know. It might have been a slow year. I'm not sure. Um, uh, it does have, I mean, there, it grossed money. I mean, it made a little bit of money, but it was considered a flop. I mean, internationally, yeah. in the first run, it made 159 million. I think it, it did better in Europe, right? And it did much better. Much better. The U.S. Yeah. was like, we are not having this. This yeah. is not our alien movie. <laughs> this is way too depressing for us. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. We wanted uh, to see little Newt and Hicks running around. <laughs> yeah. And I agree with them. Uh, Cameron said he thought the movie was a slap in the face to what he did in Aliens. Uh, he said he didn't blame Fincher, but I mean, Fincher, I was saying before, I'll save it for later. Fincher said uh, recently, he said, nobody hates Alien 3 more than I do. Um, he, and he's said over the years, several other things like the famous one was I tried to give him a teacup and they wanted a beer mug <laughs> you know, <laughs> that one I like, or a China cup. 
tried to give him a China cup. Um, <laughs> I people, like that. Uh, I like that Cameron's on his side. He knows. Yeah. He yeah. knows. He was. He knows that Fincher was just a young guy being, you know, trying his best to pull out his first feature film. You know, you have this huge studio thing, great opportunity. It just so happens that you're still stuck in a movie with no script and no schedule. And the and thing no- is, they, they treated it like it was. I mean, yeah. I mean, the first two Alien movies were blockbuster hits, but I mean, when they were making it, I mean, the budgets weren't. Mm-mm. No, blockbuster they, budgets at the time. No, not at all. And again, this goes back to the strange studio thing where you actually waste more money when you Trying have to no say. direction. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's that, that saying, you know, I, I'm so busy counting pennies, I'm losing dollars. Yes, that's right. That's right. If you just took your time, didn't worry about that release date, just you'll get another one. You can do summer of the year after, you know, if you wanted yeah. to do a summer thing. Just put coming, you know, coming soon or don't even release anything yet. Just make an announcement, you know, right. we're working on this. This is, you know. And in hindsight, looking at this movie, do you really think this needed to be released in the summer? Is this really a summer blockbuster? It's a totally different movie than the other ones. It's much more cerebral and dark and sad. Yeah. They actually have, they came up with a somebody came up with a, a well depressive. they probably they probably picked summer when it was going to be set on Earth and then when the first guy did the two parter and yeah and then they it just was going to be a it. different tone and they're like yeah summer right because the Rennie Harlan version the William Gibson script does sound a lot more uh, and, uh, tonally it sounds a lot more like the Cameron yeah. uh, vision you know with fighting on Anchor Point and all that. Uh, this, I think what we ended up with was Fincher's cobbled together version of the Vincent Ward idea with a little bit of Tui thrown in. Yeah. And I can understand why after this Fincher uh, insisted on Final Cut, you know, he, you know, you know what it sounds like? It's like they took all the scripts and put it in the telepod and fly and they <laughs> transported it over and it came out all deformed. It came out as that weird deformed thing that's partly yes. telepod and partly. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah, a good yeah. analogy. <laughs> really good analogy. Um, so anyway, I mean, that's sort of the story of, of Alien 3. Poor Alien 3. So yeah. depressed. I remember seeing it. I remember when it came out, it was such a big deal. I was like, oh, God, there's an alien. You had action figures, you, you know. Yeah. And then I, I remember they saw had it, like, it. But the funny thing was they had, like, Taco Bell tie-ins. Yes. Then you watch this movie, and you're like, what is this? This is not a Taco Bell movie, sir. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Not at all, but they were still trying for it. Yeah, yeah. it was. I but just this was post Batman. Being, post- well, like I said, I remember seeing it and just being, even at a young age, I was just like, I feel, and later I feel, that's the feeling of depression that you feel. You felt really depressed. It's like, yeah. they're all dead within the five, first five, ten minutes. Okay. You know, it was just, it was just a downer. And then the rest of the time you spend this time in this dark, dreary place meditating over religious issues with a bunch of monastic Rapists prisoners. Yeah. yeah, it's I mean, you know, it's a different it's a whole different Yeah. You can see why in Alien Resurrection they were like, Let's go back to action. You know. But they took it a little too. Yeah. And I don't know, what do you think? Do you think we should do Alien Resurrection? Well let, let well, well if any let let people comment and let us know. Okay, if you want to see Alien Resurrection, we'll do that. I'm still on the fence about it. I think there's some interesting stuff we could do, honestly, yeah. but I'd have to think about it. Um, but anyway, uh, I want to go ahead and promote my book, which I have yes. in front of my face. Right um, there. It's Buy available, it. available at, uh, on Amazon, in paperback and ebook form. Grim Grimoire, a collection of horror short stories written by me for you. Yes. And Rebecca, you have some channels. Tell us about I do. I do. I have one that I've, um, I just talk about all the health stuff that I'm into, products, and and it's, right now it's called Ravi Girl Fitness. Um, And then I have a second channel, which is my music channel. Um, 
I have a music video up right now, and then I have a video where I talk about the guitar I play, and I play one of my original songs in it. Um, I'm looking to do more episodes of that with different styles of guitars with people I know and that do a lot of music. Um, and I've just been gigging and trying to get back in the studio and record some music. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I feel like busy... my, 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 my little health channel the past week or so has been ignored a little bit because I have been gigging a lot and, uh, and working on some stuff with the music. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, a lot of stuff going on with, with both of us, but I think especially yeah. with, with your channels, I want you guys to go over and like, subscribe, check them out. Please, uh, please like and subscribe. And also, um, I don't know if I've said this on the show yet, but um, I also just got my yoga 200 um, oh. hour certification. So I'm also, when I'm not doing music in this, I'm, you know, doing some yes. yoga gigs as well, which is what really inspired the, the health channel, health well, and lifestyle channel, I guess you could call it. Well, it's some good stuff too, and I've watched it, and I, it it's, it helps me because I don't know anything about a lot of that <laughs> stuff, but it is actually quite informative. And well, I, I mean, I've said a couple times to you, I was like, "Damn, I didn't know you knew that much about these things." It's pretty well, impressive. It's called asking questions and reading a lot, mostly <laughs> asking a lot of questions from people who do know stuff. I'm like, so what is? Huh? Yeah, over the years, and. Um, I have been working on a video for it. I just haven't posted it. It's the legging. I did a legging box opening and I did, I have recorded the video. I just got to edit together. But a lot of the legging try ons, they require a squat test. Mm. And, um, and I feel like a complete jackass doing the squat test. So, well, yeah, stay tuned see, for that video. You'll, you'll I... see, you'll see it. And you'll see me going, yeah, okay, yeah, right, okay. It's just me not liking that part of it. <laughs> well, if that's not the perfect tease, I don't know what is. Go check them out. <laughs> when it comes out, out. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah. But it, I appreciate you jumping on here from from the moon because as we from established, the moon. That's, that's right. That's right. Are. Actually, there's a little alien embryo up there in the left corner. You just can't see. It's right out of frame. You, you know. You are the new Ripley. That's right. No, uh, I'll probably be Newt. I'll be the dead one. You know? The dead one. The, yeah. <laughs> who knows what When I, I go into stasis, you know. Yeah. Either that I, or I'll be like, uh, um, oh gosh, Red Dwarf. Uh -huh. I don't come out of stasis for, for years and years and years. And it's just me and a hologram and a computer talking to me and a mutated cat. That would be my luck, I think. Yeah. <laughs> But anyway, guys, I appreciate you guys joining us today for our Alien 3 discussion. And we'll be back next week with some more interesting stuff. So until yeah. then, uh, take care of yourselves.